I appreciate you watching, but since you might be taking time away from your passion project and the theme of the movie is to spend your time on this earth wisely, I just hope you have enough time in your schedule to watch today's episode. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. Folks, we have an amazing episode for you today, but it's a short one, so you can get back to your passion project. You know, when the rollout of Soul was unclear, they did a September press day when it was going to come out in October. And then it got delayed until Christmas, which was, you know, a cool time to release it. So I've been sitting on this for a while and I wanted to post it, you know, right in the new year after everybody had a chance to watch it. But interestingly, when I did this interview, I had only seen 30 minutes of the movie, the first 30 minutes. That's where they stopped us, kind of like a cliffhanger for journalists. And um, so the only story points that we would discuss in here are about the first 30 minutes of the movie. But because of that, and because there was a chance that this was going to come out before the movie even came out, I leaned into process pretty heavily and, you know, background of, of, of course on the, on the folks as well. So we have a great lineup for you today. We talked to the story team in the first segment. So that includes Kristen Lester, the story supervisor, Michael Yates, the story artist and Afton Corbin, a story artist. So I, I did it those three folks first, and we we talked about their process on the Pixar story team. And then we went into a second session uh, for our second round of interviews. And it was with producer Dana Murray, and then co-writer, director Pete Doctor, and then co-writer, director Kemp Powers. And so it was it was kind of cool like to to have these groups like this. I am in my mind considering this part one. That's why I titled it part one, because inevitably, since I cover Pixar movies so well in the podcast for so many years now, there will be a part two and it will come probably later in the award season uh, when when folks are doing a new round of press and we'll get into the deeper dynamics of the movie. So, you know, look, this was an all-star team. It was it was a fun interview to do, knowing that eventually that there would be a part two and there will be a part two. So I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, of course, we just published issue 42 of Backstory Magazine. And the good news is there is a sole article in the magazine. It was written by Backstory Magazine's associate editor, Danny Monso, who, who does pretty much all of our Pixar stuff. And Danny's a Pixar expert, to say the least. And he interviewed all three of the co-writers so pete doctor kemp powers and mike jones and so it's a very in-depth piece and danny of course had seen the entire movie by the time he did his interviews so uh you know there's that to look forward to and honestly if you've never read backstory magazine there is a lot that we put into issue 42 and one of the things that we do this cool is every time we publish an issue we keep adding stuff to it even after we've published. So our table of contents actually grows between issues. There's always a reason to check back. Um, there's a lot of amazing stuff in there. I love our cover, which uh, has a crazy pandemic Zoom call between, uh, you know, Cole from 12 Monkeys and some of the characters from articles within our magazine, including Soul, of course. And uh, there's there's a lot of great stuff to explore in our table of contents to see what's inside. So you could check it out at Backstory.net. Of course, we'd love your support. So if you want to subscribe to Backstory Magazine, you could uh, use code SAVE5, that's SAVE and the number 5, and you could use that code while checking out at Backstory.net. If you've never read us, you could read the free issue at Backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop and a laptop or through the Backstory app on your iPhone, and you could find the free issue at any of those places. So look, it would mean a lot to us to have you join us for my passion project, Backstory Magazine. So thanks for considering. Okay, so now without any further ado, we are going to get into phase one of our interview uh, with the Pixar story team. So we are going to be talking to Kristen Lester, the story supervisor, Michael Yates, a story artist, and Afton Corbin, a story artist. And these three fine folks are on Pixar's story team, and we're going to talk to them about their process. You know, I think that I think the easiest question to start with would be, um, what was your most? Because we we like to talk about the craft of storytelling. So, what was your most eye opening experience during Soul, regarding your creative process? Uh, a moment where you realized, oh, you know, in the past I've kind of done things like X, but on this movie I'm I'm going to adjust my my process to compensate for this creative challenge, whatever it happens to be. Mm, mm, that's good. I mean, definitely just from my own personal experience, um, I there. <laughs> I guess the thing that I learned the most is, man, 
you can think that something works in script and then you, you know, you storyboard it and you cut it together and you watch it and you're like, wow, that didn't work. And then, you know, you have the inverse, which is like something, you write something in script and you're like, this is never going to work. And then you cut it together and you watch it in editorial and you're like, I don't know why, but that totally worked. <laughs> so definitely, I think for my own creative process, uh, I definitely feel like I learned that there's some sort of magic voodoo or something out there that sometimes, you know, the stuff that you don't think was going to work is going to work. And uh, just to leave yourself open to the possibility that this thing that might not work here might work somewhere else. Just before we move on, Kristen, is, is, do you, is there a specific example you want to, you want to cite about a part Ooh. that maybe is it early on in the movie that you didn't think would work that did or vice versa, like you just said, and then we'll get to Michael and Apton. Oh gosh. Uh, yeah, I mean, there were so many. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think, let me think of a specific one. Um, no, I can't really remember anything off the top of my head. All right. Jump um, back in if it comes to you then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me let me get back to you about that. Afton, something that, that changed in your creative process that you remember? I think since Soul was just such a uh, unique project, it was... Um, I, the only other thing I had worked on up until this point was Toy Story 4. So you go from a beloved franchise that everyone knows to uh, the world of the, no, the Soul universe and the meaning of life. And the only thing I could rely on was my personal experience. And I think that was something that, like, you know, they say it. And then this is a point where you had to because there's nothing else to, to guide you through any of this. And I feel like that was always a lid whenever I went back to what would be entertaining to me or what questions I asked when I was um, uh, skeptical in that 22 mindset or what I found entertaining usually helped. So uh, relying on some gut instinct and um, uh utilizing um, past experiences for creativity, I thought would, uh, ended up being really helpful for something so inventive as the soul world. You, you know, Afton, just to comment on what you were saying a second ago, since you were doing Toy Story 4 and it's a known franchise, characters have been around for over 25 years, you're, you're going into the known realm. Here you're going into the unknown and you're doing world building. Did you, did you find there was specific challenges that you had to meet with possibly clearer lines and clearer definitions in the, in the world of world building per se for soul. Yeah. I was joking with a couple uh, interviews ago, but truthfully, when I heard about the soul idea and the premise, I was like, Oh, I want no parts of that. Uh, it sounds <laughs> extremely intimidating and um, uh, extremely uh, ambitious. Um, but once we got into it and then say, you know, joined the team, it was, um, it was creativity. I feel like on a whole another level and I was able to experience it with such other creative people and just see what it's like to just build on top of each other and, um, craft something that, um, we could completely come up with from our own heads. And, uh, um, yeah, it, it it was uh, very challenging, but very fun at the same time. And we just, the sky was the limit as far as what this world could look like. Michael. Uh, yeah, I think one big shift in my, I guess, work and creative philosophy was like on previous films, like before this one, I was also in Toy Story 4. A lot of times if I have an idea, I would kind of sit on it until I figured it out completely. Like, how would I shoot this? What is, how is this going to affect everything else in the film? And I think on this one, since it's so much of just the best idea rises to the top, I found myself pitching things much earlier without having it figured out. Just like, wouldn't it be cool if one of the juries did this? And then it's just like talking with the team and people would take those ideas and then run with them. And it felt like it was much more, I guess, um, much more of a creative endeavor and much more fun and challenging in that way than previous films where it's a lot more um, problem solving, but you kind of know where you're going with it, where this one is more like you have no idea what's going to work or what's not. Well, Michael, it's really interesting you brought that up because one of the things that's so great about Pixar is they have their own dedicated story department. And there's always this chicken before the egg type of dilemma in which as you said, if you as a story artist pitch an idea, it then, if it's accepted, goes into script, and then it comes back to you once it's scripted for 
you know, a visual representation. What, what do you guys want to talk about that process just to give our readers a little more knowledge on, on just the production chain and how it works? Because it's so fluid, but it, it's fascinating to think that an idea off of the whiteboard then goes onto the page and is battled on the page for a while. And then you see it again in another form when it's time to board it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely um, like a back and forth kind of process, you know, uh, just kind of like what I was saying earlier, usually the way that we work is that we, you know, we card out the whole film on uh, index cards. So we kind of have a general idea of the direction that we're going. And mostly it's like, so we are all in agreement, like the, uh, the leadership team is all in agreement with like what we're trying to pursue and how we're trying to pursue it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, our writers will go off and write. Uh, once we'll vet that a little bit, uh, it will come to story and we'll give it to a story artist and story will draw it, add to it, collaborate with it. Again, I think that's in part why that uh, carding, the doing the carding is so important up front because we, we're just literally trying to agree as a group about what the fundamentals are that we're trying to pursue. So when people pitch ideas, we know like, oh, okay, this is in, this is in the realm of what we're trying to pursue, or this is going to make what we're trying to pursue better. Uh, this is kind of like outside of what we're trying to do. So maybe let's hold on to that for later. Um, and as long as sort of the ideas are sort of in that, in that sort of basket of helping us get closer to what our goal is, then we're like, I'll take that and that and that and that. And then of course, you know, that means that sometimes ideas kind of go back and forth between departments. Like a story artist will pitch something and we'll be like, ah, that was way better than what we wrote. So we'll go back to writing, we'll rewrite it, and then we'll come back to story. And then eventually, you know, the proof is in the pudding when it goes to editorial and it gets cut together and we watch it. Uh, then we really know whether or not we have something or not. Okay, Chris, and so you walked into this one, but but just because I interview so many screenwriters and writers, I love to geek out on carding. <laughs> so I'm sure. going to ask you a couple of questions. Do you sure. have any, and some writers, there's no right answer, by the way. Some writers have a certain card limit per act. They Ooh, say like, oh, oh I need 15 cards for act one and 20 for act two, blah, blah, blah. Do you have any sort of limits like that? And also, how do you color code your cards? Because sometimes for tracking, story teams and past people at Pixar that I've interviewed sometimes have green cards equal character, blue cards equal narrative, you know, red equals emotional moments, stuff like that. So I would love to hear more about your tracking process and your cards. Sure. Um, uh, for this film, I, I can speak to this film in particular. Um, you know, we tried to, as far as like color coordinating and stuff like that, we tried to keep it as simple as possible. Like you, did you, in our presentation, you saw that image of all the cards with just all the cards on the ground. I loved uh, them on the ground. That was my favorite part of it. Yeah. That's uh, all Pete. Pete is like, it's <laughs> in some ways it's like, how will people know if we're working? We'll just take our stuff and we'll throw it on the ground and then they'll know they'll see the littered pile of ideas. <laughs> that are all on the floor. Um, but so when we're in that kind of state, we're not really, um, like we're not being, uh, how do I describe it? We're not being uh, so analytical. Like we're literally trying to write as fast as we can come up with ideas. So it's like, we're just grabbing index cards from like wherever they come from. So they're like purple, green, blue, pink. They're not organized. Uh, thank God they're pinned up to a board because if a wind came, it would blow them all away and Lord knows what order they went in. Well, what, um, colors, what colors do you focus on? Oh, we just like, like literally it's um, the only time that we ever have sort of like a real delineation in terms of carding is that we'll go, uh, uh, we have sequence titles. So our sequence titles, will pick usually a particular color for those cards. So we'll be like all sequence titles are in white, for example. Uh, and then what goes underneath them uh, in terms of character beats, character moments, what's happening in the plot, those can be like, they're not assigned a particular color. We're just literally like, uh, I got to write something. Uh, where's a card? And you just grab it and you're like, uh, 22 does this. And then you pin it up and then it's like, I got to write the next thing. Where's another card? Uh, Joe does this. And like, one's pink, one's green, one's yellow, one's okay. purple. Like, um, Briefly, how long would you say that process lasts for? The carding uh, process. The carding process? It depends on what stage of production we're in. Like, at the beginning of the film, you know, that carding process, uh, we do that for a long time before we go to, you know, our next stage is outline. And then after that, it's treatment. And then after that, it's script. Uh, once we start getting into sort of the screening cycle of things, we usually card for maybe about a week at most. 
Okay, so um, you continue carting that far into the process. Oh yeah, I mean we're you know we're going back to cards. You sometimes I would say like up to screening five, uh, because we really want to know. You know, we're for the most part we're visual people, and so the way that we work best is we work best by seeing our movie displayed over like a large and sim- really simple like visual field. And so uh, carding just helps us understand what we're doing with the story in a global way. Like I think that's one of the things that I think was really special. Well, uh, it's special about Pixar, but it was special about soul in particular, which was we were always trying to judge the movie in context with itself. So we would never do a thing where we like looked at one scene, one sequence alone or two sequences alone. We were like, we need to watch a whole act or we're watching act one and act two together. And like as fast as possible, because the only way we're going to know this movie's any good is if we watch it in context with ourselves or with itself. Sorry. It, it's just rare to hear of, of carding that late in the process. So that's wild because you already have an outline and a treatment, but that's cool. I love, I love the way you guys break it down. Uh, one last question for, for Michael and Afton, but, but Kristen, just percentage wise, how many cards that ended up on the floor? What percentage oh made it back up? What percentage made it back up to the board? <laughs> I mean, discarded I, idea getting a second life. Oh, I mean, Oh, a discarded idea getting a second life. I mean, yeah, those, what things percentage? Always, uh, those things always came back. It was really okay, weird. Okay. We would have it's an idea and be like, we love it. And we're like, if we love it, if it doesn't work right now, we're going to throw it on the ground and we're going to get rid of it. And if it's worth it, it will come back. I guarantee yeah. it. It's always right. interesting to, to, to win the story process of that where you're like, you pitch an idea and the director doesn't quite hear it. You're like, okay, we'll try again later. And you do it again. Not yet. He's not ready. And then you do it a third time. And that time you're like, oh, and you're like, yes, it landed. Um, it, it always happens that way um, where it's just, uh, it's just, there's not enough room for it yet. But um, yeah. That's great. But Michael and, and Afton, last question, was there anything that really was your most difficult thing to visualize from the page to, to be able to draw it out? And, you know, if you want to tell us how you overcame that creative challenge, because some of these things are difficult concepts and it's easy for a writer to write them, but it's a completely different thing to visualize them. And I know that that's a huge question, but if, if there's something quick and easy that comes to mind, I know we're running out of time. Yeah, for me, it would be the scene that we showed in the presentation, the uh, Joe's life scene, because first of all, we boarded that a bunch of different ways. And every single time it was Pete, like, so Joe is walking and he's seeing all of his life flashing in cones across the uh, this blank atrium. So I'm like, okay, so we have to draw his entire life in beams of light. Like, wh- wh- that. how do you fill, a, um, you know, a board... Uh, 1920 by 1080 with the uh, moments of the character's life in an appealing way. And that was one where it's like a couple sentences in a script that's going to take me hours and hours to actually craft. Um, so that one, I think uh, when we finally were able to lock that visual down, it was a huge relief. That's yeah, awesome. I would agree with that. And then just in general, not specific scenes or anything, but just the, the great before the youth seminar, the astral plane. I think all of that is just like picking different people kind of jumping in there and throwing in different ideas. And it sort of evolves over time. But I think that one was one that was like uh, really rewarding to see at the end. It looks fantastic. I can't wait to see the rest of the film, you guys. So pat yourselves on the bat virtually, <laughs> but you, you did great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thanks for your time today. Ooh, hey, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine. That's right, folks. We just published issue 42, and we are really happy with it. It came out so great, and there's so many cool things in there. We are one of the only places in the world where you could read the original ending of 12 Monkeys, which we kind of, you know, lampooned a little on our cover. We had fun with because we're, we're having the folks from 12 Monkeys do a Zoom call with other folks that are other characters and other movies that are in other articles in the magazine. And, uh, you know, we published the original ending in our interview with the screenwriters david and janet peoples uh for 12 monkeys we have exclusive screenplays simon kinberg gave us the first screenplay that he ever sold that's right simon kinberg of x-men days of future past and and mr and mrs smith so you could read that joe carnahan uh gave us a screenplay of his with uh you know a, a project that he's been trying to make for years called la 58 and it's it's really amazing and you know 
these these have great interviews that go along. It's not like we're just publishing the screenplay, but we're showing great works by writers of note and they're talking about their works. And that's what's one of the fun things that I've always loved about Backstory is that we're able to get stuff out there that you really wouldn't see anywhere else. And by the way, both Simon, you know, Simon, Simon doesn't really think that his screenplay will ever be produced, but Joe Carnahan is still actively moving forward on trying to get his screenplay produced. And I hope he does because it's pretty freaking awesome. Another cool thing in issue 42 is our associate editor, Danny Munso, did a great Pixar story on Soul. In our magazine, he talked about all the spoilers of the movie. He had seen the whole movie, unlike this interview you're listening to now, where I'd only seen the first 30 minutes. And Danny talked to Pete Doctor, Kent Powers, and also Mike Jones. And it's it's a it's a very in-depth piece that will answer a lot of questions about the rest of the movie and what they were thinking for the end of the movie, and of course the craft of making this great movie. So, you know, I really love Soul, and so does Danny. So we were really happy to to get it in the magazine for a more in-depth piece and eventually. Eventually, we'll do another uh, longer podcast interview uh, as well as the award season continues. I hope you'll check out our table of contents at Backstory.net. You can read us on a desktop or laptop or through our iPad app, Backstory. Um, and you could read the free issue if you've never read us before. It's 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 in there. And that'll give you a, a way to test drive us. So if you decide you want to subscribe, you could use discount code SAVE5. That's SAVE in the number five over at Backstory.net. And that'll save you $5 off a one-year subscription. And it would really mean a lot to us to have you as a subscriber. You get access to our archive, which goes out back to, I don't know, issue 29 or 20, 29 or 30 right now. That's about two years of issues, and we're going to keep adding new, older issues to our archive. It's just a very tedious process because we have to do it one issue at a time and article by article uh, of correcting and uploading. So it's kind of a pain, but we're building our archives. You'll be able to eventually read almost all of what we've written in Backstory Magazine. And uh, look, I really appreciate you considering giving my passion project a shot and subscribing. Your subscription is more important than ever now. And I'm trying to get as many of my podcast listeners to to check it out. Uh, you know, also, in case you haven't uh, checked out our YouTube page, you could watch all these interviews on YouTube because during the pandemic, we're doing them all through Zooms. So just type Backstory Magazine onto YouTube and you'll be able to find it. And now we're going to get into phase two of this interview uh, in, in which we were talking about only the first 30 minutes of the movie, if that. And uh, we talked to Dana Murray, the producer, and also uh, Pete Doctor, who is the co-writer and co-director, and Kemp Powers, who is the co-writer and co-director. And uh, let's get right into it. We're going to start with an easy one, just 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 for the fans out there, for Pete, uh, you know, since we're going to be talking about storytelling. Pixar is known for having this very fluid story telling process and things that have been built in the computer that have been agreed to in the story phase, they could change on a moment's notice. So Pete, out of all of your films, what was the most interesting story item or character that you held on to for a long time at Pixar, but then was scuttled towards the end of the project that fans would be interested to hear about? And what was that like for you? Hmm. Fluid is a very kind way of putting it. Yes. Uh, uh, let's see. What's the most? Well, I mean, I don't know if this is a secret or not, but Doug the dog was developed as part of another film, which I won't pitch to you because who knows? We may do it still. But that we held on to for a long time, and then it finally just died out, and we're like, oh man. But the character we liked, so we just shoved it into this new story, and uh, um, up became for a while we got notes i think from andrew or somebody who said you know this movie just seems like a bunch of stuff that you like thrown together and it kind of was um uh, but then we had to work and this is the craft of it is like getting all these pieces to thematically fit and resonate with each other so that it doesn't feel like a bunch of stuff that you like thrown together it feels like one cohesive statement and pete on that note did the dog have a translator in the other in the other movie doug Doug spoke. Um, I think in that one, it was some other device that got him to speak. And that was the character we just loved. The, hi, I am Doug. I have just met you and I love you. That thing uh, was what we liked about it. And then we had to come up with a whole excuse as to why he talked. And that was the technology of the collars, et cetera, et cetera. So. Okay. Uh, Kemp, a question for you about, about writing. Really going back a little, addressing culture in genre. You, you worked on Star Trek Discovery. And, you know, there were, there were two characters there where you were dealing with cultural differences. Obviously, Berman, uh, who grew up with Spock as a human, had, had a cultural difference that, that, that 
she was addressing. And of course, also Saru um, had had a cultural situation that, that they were addressing as kind of being led into the Federation. What did you learn about kind of this outsider looking in, um, in, in the form of genre for addressing cultural differences? Well, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, of course, the, the Burnham character was um, Brian Fuller, the uh, creator and showrunner's idea. But the idea of Saru, um, Brian came up, I, I don't know if you know, but in Saru's um, initial iteration, he had 10 eyes. Um, so he had a whole bunch of eyes because it was actually my idea to have him. I remember pitching Joe Minoski. I was like, this crazy character with the 10 eyes, we have to explain why he's not in the Federation, why none of his race are in the Federation in Star Trek that comes later. So, you know, spiders actually hunt by sight. So I was like, what if we have this character has 10 eyes? Why, as opposed to hunting by sight, what if his whole planet is a prey species? And so that's kind of where the idea for Saru came. And of course, because of budget, 10 eyes became two eyes, but the initial idea. <laughs> this so, is the best uh, interview we've had so far. Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> Sorry, he brought it up, man. Like if you're gonna ask me. It's gonna good, ask, it's good, keep going. Questions, I gotta go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of things in Star Trek are born a necessity, <laughs> mm. you know? And, and that was the case. I mean, it really came from this place of just Here's a culture in Star Trek that takes place before the original series, apparently. Because keep in mind, this is at a time when Brian Fuller, who was the original showrunner, was like, one thing we're never going to do is time travel. Now, as you know, Brian Fuller, when they let go of him, the next thing you know, they went yes. to the future. So they went in, to the Brian's future. Mind, no, no. <laughs> in Brian's mind, one thing we were never going to do was time travel. So it was like, we, it was about coming up with an explanation. So it was like Saru had to be from a class M planet where he was the only one of his species that basically ended up on a Federation ship and he couldn't go home. And the idea of the whole threat ganglia was, I think, a replacement for him having 10 eyes because eight of those eyes were going to have to be animated, digitally animated. Right, right. No, that, yeah. So the, whereas the threat ganglia only appear whenever he... Sorry, guys. He, he brought... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to shift. I love your answer, Kemp, but I was just running a limited time. That was a, that was a fantastic answer. So thank you yeah. for that. Uh, uh, just this, this is the most over asked question. So short answer is perfect. But coming up with the concept of somebody at the prime of their life when things are starting to click, I know this is over asked, but and then and then dying and then wanting to come back it has roots of course in, in heaven can wait you know previous films like that of course there's a little bit of oh god with having a mentor you know that that has divine powers that that's able to kind of intervene i'm curious what some of your influences were you guys for coming up with the concept behind soul well the the original kind of concept was like why is it that we all seem to have a very distinctive approach to life of specific unique personality you know, I have two sisters who are totally different than me. We have spring from the same gene pool. Why is it that we're different? Um, and watching my own kids was kind of the real uh, spark of it. So thinking about where we were before we were born, which is like, what? You know, that was uh, the beginning of it. And then, you know, looking at other films, like you mentioned, um, Heaven Kuwait, uh, uh, we looked at Defending Your Life. Um, there's Great a bizarre one. movie called Bluebird of Happiness with uh, Shirley Temple. Wow. And that, I think, was the only movie we could, we could find that even... A pre and it's not the whole thing. It's like a strange seven-minute section that talks about before life. Um, so that was a weird one. Yeah, I was, uh, I was a huge fan of um, um, It's a Wonderful Life. Um, I, I love a lot of the classic family films that kind of have some of these themes. And, and when you go back and watch them again, it is amazing how dark a lot of them go. You know what I mean? Like you, I, I, I didn't see It's a Wonderful Life for the first time until I was in my thirties. So I was really, really kind of caught off guard um, by that film. And, um, you know, some films like that in A Christmas Carol um, and just some of these, these, these classic, um, you know, lessons learning about appreciating what you have, about not being in characters who aren't happy with the, with the gifts that they're given until they're taken away from them. Um, I, a lot of those things were, were at least an emotional inspiration for me. That's that's fantastic. Um, you know, exposition is the enemy of all writers um, and and directors. It's it's something that people hate to do. Your your first act, you know, what we saw in the footage, which I know is a little over your first act, it was so well done, 
and you're you were just gliding through really definitions of character, narrative, and and the problem at hand. What, what were the challenges for you guys on the page with with dealing with exposition? Because you never want it to be boring, but clarity is important. So you have to be able to spell it out in an entertaining fashion. And you you did so beautifully. We we totally put ourselves in a pickle because we kept coming up with different worlds. So we're like, all right, here's a bunch of exposition about Joey. He's a teacher. He wants this. And then here's his mom. And now he dies. Okay. Now he's in this other place. It's never been born. And then here's how that works. Okay. Now he goes to third place. That's sort of thing. So we just cut, we, we made our life really hard for ourselves. Um, but I guess um, I don't have any really clear quick answer other than it's a lot of craft it's a lot of just going over and over the page to be like do we really need to know this now do we need to know it at all can we see it visually do we need to say it can we you know like just over and sifting over and over through the sequence both on the page and in editorial inevitably i'm i'm always amazed by how often you write something and you're like no no i need to know this and then you get to editorial and you're like i can lose it and it's fine I can cut it out. Like there's so much that can be implied, inferred that the audience, I think the audience actually appreciates a little bit of mystery. Like they don't want everything answered. They want to, yeah. have, to have ability to ask some of their own questions. Well, I guess Pete, as a follow-up in the same question for you, Kemp is, is do you remember a piece of ex exposition that you struggled with at that point in the movie that we saw and, and how you rose to that challenge creatively? Maybe something that, Oh, originally I was going to explain, this this way but then we realized it was going to take four minutes so we were able to just do it with you know brush stroke x well here's um, one oh go ahead kim well for me i think it was um joe just when he first arrives it's it's so funny the solution was a bit of exposition but it was like the lesser of two exposition evils and that is when joe ends up in the the, the scene that we call theater when he kind of goes into the theater and Jerry is on the screen kind of doing like a PSA on why they're all here. The scene was way longer. There, there was a lot more. We were just walking Joe through all these elements of the youth seminar, and it was really, really dragging. And I think just coming up with that theater scene, which while, you know, expository, also, one, it was very funny, you know, so it was like, you know, it got people laughing. But it also really allowed us to let go of a lot of things that we were spelling out before that we didn't need to spell out. And it helped people understand exactly what was going on and, and what was next, especially young people, especially kids. And the theater scene you're talking about, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm thinking of the right one, Kemp. When Joe goes into the theater and is like, hello, mentors, you are now basically okay, okay. mentors are being told what their job is. Right, yeah, like yeah. the Jurassic Park ride sequence, the movie yeah, that they exactly. see. Okay, exactly. yeah, yeah. So, okay. I'm thinking so of a similar got scene. By saber, you know, in, in the office. <laughs> yeah, right before that, when Joe drops into the great before, you know, I think there were versions where we just had somebody come up and say, "Hello, you're in the great before, and you're a counselor, and there's what you're gonna do," and then not quite so bold as I just did, bald face. But um, we found it was way more interesting to let the character and the audience be in the same place where you're like, okay, wait a minute, give me some time to soak this in and I'm gonna get to ask one question at a time and I'm not just gonna give you all the answers. Like prolong the, um, the mystery a little bit. Um, that, that was, a, 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 um, I don't know how many passes that, that we took, but it was a lot. <laughs> you know, one of, the, one of the things that you did beautifully is obviously you're getting into this concept of afterlife and souls and you did it in a, in a non-religious denominational aspect, which is what I expected, but you, you really glided through that as well. What were the, what were the challenges there? I mean, they, was, they do mention the word hell once, but other than that... Right. Is this heaven? It, um, yeah, no, that was the thing that when we first pitched this was the most worrying to most people. Like, oh, no, we're going we're gonna to step in something and piss off half of the world, <laughs> you know? Um, and so... We really worked hard to avoid that. I mean, we had the, the good thing we had going for us is very few religions talk about before life. A lot of talk about afterlife, and that could have gotten us in trouble. In fact, we had a, we had a couple scenes that we wrote where Joe went into the light. This is later in the film. Uh, and um, we decided, you know, maybe we shouldn't do that. Let's and Obviously, well, anyway, we, we took those out. So, so we had that advantage that we could kind of make things up. 
Uh, and then, I don't know, I was sort of intrigued by the idea that maybe we could make fun of every world religion. Maybe as long as we're sort of egalitarian about it. Uh, we ended up kind of stepping away from it because it's not a theological movie. We, we don't get into that kind of thing. Or and, and we also stepped away from the more obvious, like, business uh workplace humor that we've done before like monsters inc it's just they scare kids for a living they clock in they clock out you know that would have been an easy place to go um but the more we worked with it we felt like no this deserves a different approach you know it's interesting that and i promise you i do have a question for dana at the end so i'm not forgetting that you're here i see you dana uh it's interesting because we're just starting to meet what i think is an antagonist or maybe the antagonist the accountant per se mm -hmm. um at, from the clip that we saw what were the challenges of of introducing an antagonist in general because in a movie even for children but it really is for quadrant that had an existential question of meaning of life getting the most out of life that in itself is an antagonist but it's faceless there it's not defined you have to pin it on somebody and it seems like you were maybe leaning into the direction that at least a gatekeeper, if not the movie's antagonist, could be this accountant character we, we, we met. So I'm just curious about, about that concept of an, of an antagonist. Yeah, for a long time, he was his own antagonist. We didn't have one. Um, and then I think it was as a result of a brain trust meeting that the concept came up and then Camp kind of put this pitch together. And uh, it, we, you know, we kind of struggled with it for a couple of beats, but it pretty quickly found its way to be thank, 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 uh, largely thanks to uh, um, the writing and the performance of uh, oh, uh, the, the the actor we have not yet announced. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it 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 worked really well because there were ports, portions of the film where we lacked drive a little bit, and and so that. Kemp, do you have anything to add before I hog all the conversation? That was the reason behind the pitch is because we were really meandering too much. And, you know, it always helps to have some kind of ticking clock. And as opposed to like, oh, I've got to get it done by the time the clock strikes 12, we, we kind of lock, locked in on this idea of like, there's this force after him and he doesn't even know it. So that that really worked. And, and, and it was also like a great, once we locked in on an actor who could play the part, it was just so funny as well. Like every time the character showed up, everyone was just kind of rolling and, and wanted more of the character. So yeah, it worked its way into the film that way. So storytelling mechanics wise, basically a, a, a somebody that was keeping things moving is what they were saying. Yeah. The, okay. And Dana, it's, it's your first feature film as a producer. Was there, was there anything that, that changed significantly about your creative process that you noticed that is worth pointing out kind of coming in through this trial by fire being a producer for the first time on, on a feature. Yeah, I mean, I think I got to be way more a uh, part of the creative process than I had before, which was, um, I, I learned a lot and I really enjoyed it. Um, and we also had a year taken out of the schedule, so it was kind of fun to like manage that <laughs> in like, in such a, like, it was such a complex film to do in such a short amount of time, in animation years, that is. Okay, cool. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. I'm sorry thank for going you. over a minute, and uh, I can't wait to see see more and interview guys. You interview you guys further. Thanks a lot. And that's how the Q and A went down. Special thanks again to the Pixar story team, including Kristen Lester, Michael Yates, and Afton Corbin, and of course Dana Murray, Pete Doctor, and Kemp Powers for being so generous with their time chatting about. Pixar's soul. And you know, I hope you check out Backstory Magazine because we have a much longer interview inside the magazine that associate editor Danny Munso did with all three of the co-writers of Soul. And it was after he had seen the movie, he gets completely into spoilers. It's beautiful. And uh, you know, that's an issue 42. Of course, I'm hoping later in the year to do another podcast that is longer, more in depth with, with Pete and Kemp for sure um, about Soul. And you know, look, while you're surfing around online, I would love it if you give Backstory Magazine a chance over at Backstory story.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or through the iPad app. And uh, if you've never read us before, you could test drive us by reading the free issue. And if you dig us, I hope you'll subscribe. You could save $5 by using discount coupon code save five. And you could do that only at backstory.net in your shopping cart there. It won't work on an iPad, uh, but you will get iPad access by subscribing at backstory.net. So it gives you all the 
best of both worlds. Um, but look, we have so much cool stuff in issue 42, which we've just published. And it would mean so much for me to have you, my podcast listeners, and my Zoom cast listeners or viewers over on YouTube at the Backstory Magazine YouTube page watching these things to check out Backstory Magazine, see what we're all about, and consider subscribing because your support means everything during the pandemic as we continue to publish new content. And I'm really proud of what we did in issue 42. So thanks for considering. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2021. All rights reserved. You know, if you want to reach me on social media, you can find me as Yo Goldsmith or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter or on Instagram. I'm, I'm the same names in both places. I have a Facebook fan page. I'm not on Facebook really all that much, uh, but you could try reaching out there. You could always email me at Yo Goldsmith at gmail.com. Uh, that's another way to reach me. Look, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.